Hey, what's up guys? So you wanna know about algae. This is one of the reasons why I'm always saying, reefing ain't easy. To prevent algae from taking over your tank, it's just not easy, it's just that simple. It takes constant monitoring, tinkering, and adjusting. The reason for that is your tank is always changing and evolving. You have a small tank, you put one coral in there, come back a year from now, as long as you didn't kill the coral, it's gonna be a lot bigger, it's gonna have different needs, different wants. At the beginning, you want really low nutrients. Nutrients is nitrates, phosphates, and that's food for whatever's in your tank. If you have a brand new tank and nothing's in there, and you put a lot of food into it, what's in there, which is inevitable, is algae. And the algae is just gonna take over and dominate your tank. However, a five-year-old tank that's got tons of fish, corals that have turned into colonies, and is thriving, it can handle more food, more nutrients, because it's got life forms to eat it, and outcompete the algae for the actual food and the actual real estate in your tank. So let me give you some tips and advice. I really just want to go over how to maintain it, how to keep it from happening, and then what to do if you have an algae outbreak. You've waited a little bit too long, it's starting to dominate your tank, but you're ready to take action and you want to get a hold of this thing as quickly as possible. So when I tell you how to maintain and what you need to be doing, after you fix your algae outbreak, you need to start doing that to prevent it from happening again, if you have the time and whatnot. So basically, you need to do three things, maybe four, three really. One is you gotta test, two is you gotta watch, and three is you gotta adjust your input and your output of nutrients. That's why I say it could have been fourth because you know, you're adjusting your input, you're adjusting your output, but really we're gonna say that's the same thing. Now, why can't I just test? Why can't I just watch? Because a lot of times you're gonna test zero and you're like, I don't get it. I got algae grown and I'm testing zero. That doesn't make sense. I'll get to that in a minute, but that's why you watch your tank as well. The reason why you need to test and not just watch is because I don't get it. Last week my tank was great, this week it's different. You wanna know, did something happen? Is there a big spike in nutrients? And then the last thing, which is adjusting the amount of nutrients in your tank, either through decreasing input, increasing input, or decreasing output, increasing output. Output meaning like exporting the nutrients. Is That's what algae is all about, is finding that equilibrium in your tank of where you don't have an algae outbreak. And the reason why reefing is so hard is that equilibrium is a moving target. That's just the way it is. But hopefully that's where you find enjoyment in the reefing hobby is tinkering with things, making a little bit of adjustment, watching, testing, seeing what changed. That's kind of the beauty and fun of being in the reefing hobby. So you've got algae, you're testing zero or really close to zero. What's going on doesn't make sense. I think the easiest way to wrap your head around this is think about tanks that have refugiums. So you've got this big refugium in your sump, it's growing chato or whatever macroalgae. So what happens is you've got, I don't know, uh, 0 0.03 phosphate and uh, one for nitrates. You have really low nutrients and your chato is getting bigger over time. You have to pull it out, dump it, pull it out, dump it. That shows you right there, you can have really low nutrients and algae can still be taking over in your tank, still growing. It's the exact same thing upstairs. You're like, I don't get it. I've got algae growing, it's spreading, it's getting big, but I have low nutrients. I have what people are recommending. Maybe you're even testing zero. It's, it's about that equilibrium. So if it's in perfect equilibrium, you would actually expect to test near zero because the exact same amount of nutrients that are entering your tank is the exact same amount of nutrients that is being eaten by the life forms in your tank. So it equals out, it's zero. Now, if you have a surplus, let's say you have high nutrients and you have a lot of algae, you should expect that algae to continue to expand and grow because there's an abundant amount of food. After that algae is done consuming and eating, there's more to go around. So let's get bigger, let's grow more, let's expand. Now, if the opposite is happening to where you've got a ton of algae and there's just not enough food to go around, that algae is gonna become weaker and some of it may die off. And the only way for you to know where your equilibrium is in your tank is to have that symbiotic relationship with it where you're making the adjustments that are necessary because you're watching it and you're testing and you're understanding how it's being affected by different variables. So in a way, it's actually pretty simple if you think about it like this. If you have an algae problem and the algae is expanding and growing everywhere and taking over your tank, 
all you have to do is decrease the amount of food the algae has and the life in your tank has to eat. Food is nitrates and phosphates or nutrients, right? So you want to decrease that. There's three ways to do it. First, whatever's going into the tank, which is just your food, feeding your fish, feeding your coral, that's the input. You can decrease that and now there's less available food to go around in your tank. Another way to decrease the amount of nutrients in your tank is to increase export. So export is stuff like your protein skimmer, your clarity filter roller mat, your filter socks. You can use chemicals like GFO, phosphate E. There's a lot of other things that I'm not even mentioning here. And basically those are literally just gonna remove it from your tank physically. It's gonna decrease the amount of overall food or nitrates and phosphates that's in your tank. The third way is to biologically change the amount of food your tank can handle. So if you think about it like this, the amount of food your tank can handle is here, and the amount of food that your tank is getting and constantly has is up here. When they're not in equilibrium, when there's a surplus, it's an opportunity for algae to expand and grow. Now what I mean by biologically is you're gonna add something to the tank that's going to consume food, so it's going to affect the amount of food your tank can handle. It's gonna raise the amount of food it can handle and hopefully bring it into equilibrium so there's no longer a surplus so that algae doesn't expand, you know? So there's a lot of different ways to do this. You can add a cleanup crew, uh, crabs, snails, urchins, tang gangs. You can add a refugium. You can do things like carbon dosing, which basically gives food to the bacteria that's going to eat extra nutrients and you can do other things like, you know, vibrant or an aquarium cleaner, adding bacteria into your tank that's going to consume food and eventually get exported in a protein skimmer or something like that. So this is a very popular method and in some ways, some of the biological stuff you put in there has a two birds with one stone kind of a compounding effect where if it actually eats the algae, not only are you increasing the amount of food your tank can handle to bring it into equilibrium, but instead of actually eating the nitrates and the phosphates in the water, at least at the beginning, it's gonna eat the algae. And the algae is extra food. It, it contains nitrates and phosphates within itself. So there is a compounding effect there to where it's gonna eat the algae until there's no more algae left, and then it still needs to get its food from somewhere, so it's going to start consuming the, that surplus, but it's bringing your tank into equilibrium is essentially what's happening. The reason it's really popular is it can do it a little bit quicker. I think even some of those bacteria, like the vibrant stuff, eats and attacks some of the algae, and then it gets exported in your protein skimmer, so there, there's a lot of advantages to doing something like that. But the whole point to keep it simple is you're trying to match what your tank can handle and the amount of food that's in there. Once that happens and there's no surplus, it's harder for algae to take over your tank. There's other factors that come into play, like just physical real estate. Like if you have a rock and it's completely covered in coralline algae or corals, it's hard for algae to grow over those and to attach to those. So it just physically has a challenge there and will need to grow somewhere else. Now let's say that you're adding stuff to your tank, your corals are getting bigger, and you don't have an algae issue, you can relax a little. Maybe if you want to feed more, because you know your fish are always asking for more food, it feels good to give them more food. As long as everything's in check, give them some more food. You're going to do a test later on anyway, see if that affected your nutrient levels. See, by watching, did that cause any issues? Um, I know it gets harder as time goes on. Man, i got to clean out the skimmer again. you got to do something, change the filter socks. Maybe you get a little bit more lax on that and you're watching and testing and everything's fine so you realize hey i can do a little bit less work and still maintain a beautiful reef tank in my opinion in the beginning it's a lot harder and as it gets older it becomes more stable and it's a little bit less work if i had to give a recommendation which again it's really hard to because every tank is different in the beginning not zero but as close as you can to zero in terms of nitrates phosphates the reason you don't want zero is bad things can happen at zero. If it really is zero and there's not enough to maintain and keep your tank alive, three bad things can happen. Uh, dinoflagellants, cyanobacteria, actually I know a lot of people think it's from excessive nitrates and phosphates, but it's actually extremely common to happen when you have zero. Biggest reason is 
you don't have any nitrates so nothing can grow but cyanobacteria gets its nitrates from the air so it has the perfect environment to thrive and take over your tank and then the third bad thing that can happen is your, your fish your corals don't have enough food so they become weak they're not healthy they're more susceptible to disease they're more susceptible to die and a lot of times some corals just look better if they're not weak and unhealthy you know they look more colorful more vibrant they grow quicker that sort of thing that's why you don't want zero but in the beginning your tank isn't colonized and until it's fully colonized and taken over with the stuff you enjoy seeing if you have too much food in there the stuff you don't enjoy seeing is going to take over your tank so now you understand that's how you maintain the tank. There's no easy way around it other than just it's work. And hopefully for you it's not work, it's play, it's enjoyment. If it's not, you might want to reconsider or get a different hobby because it's just a part of the saltwater aquarium hobby. Now, no judgment happens to the best of us. I totally understand. I've been neglecting my tank. It's already too late for that. I've got an algae outbreak, but I'm taking a sand today. I want to solve this problem. What do I do? Let me give you a step-by-step -step process of what I think is the best. First thing is two days of starving the algae. So you test, I have zero nitrates and phosphates. Okay, if I can keep it at zero for two days, am I starving it? No, because again, it's in equilibrium. You've got nutrients coming in. It's eating it as much as it can. That's its equilibrium. That's why you're at zero is because the algae's kind of reached a point where, hey, I can now consume everything that's coming in. In the past, before that, you probably had an abundant amount of food, so you were testing high. Long story short, we gotta strip out phosphates. I think the best way to do it, phosphate E or GFO for two days, run it in your tank. Even if you're testing zero on phosphates, do it anyway. And you wanna make sure that there is no phosphates. The reason we're doing this is we're gonna manually remove all of the algae that we can in your tank and it's easier to remove it if it's weak. If you starve it for a couple days, it's gonna be weaker. It's gonna pull off the rock a lot easier than if you have this really strong algae that's just been doing great lately because you created an environment where it's gonna just be really strong and take off. You don't have to do that, but I'm telling you, it'll be a lot easier to remove the algae if you starve it for a couple days. So after that, you're going to get rid of the algae from your tank manually, siphon and hydrogen peroxide, and then we'll come back into the video. You need to siphon into a sock. If you have a sump with socks, it's easy. Just put the end of the tube into the sock. If you don't, you can use the bucket with a sock method like this. It could be a big Rubbermaid tub. It doesn't have to be a five gallon bucket, but anything less than a five gallon fills up too quickly in my opinion, but just secure it into a sock as you can see here and then start siphoning the algae out. So that way all the algae stays in the sock. As soon as the bucket becomes full, all you do is dump it back into the tank and repeat. So you can see here, I'm gonna start siphoning this algae off of this rock. So if you pinch with your thumb and see how it goes up into the tube, that is one of the easiest ways to do that. Now, if the algae is not weak, you might find that it's really hard to pull it off the rock or when you pull it away, it doesn't really strip. It just kind of slides out from underneath your thumb. That's why it's really important to do that first step of weakening the algae because it's going to make this a lot easier. If the algae is actually weak enough, sometimes the suction alone from the siphon will just pull it right off the rock. This can be time consuming. And as you can see, I'm removing as much as I possibly can manually. Now, after this, if there's any rocks that you actually can remove from the tank, for instance, this rock that had most of the algae, you'll see here in a minute, I can actually remove it from the tank. You're going to want to do that, and you're going to want to treat it with hydrogen peroxide. I realize like this isn't always possible because they're glued in there, they're heavy, or they have corals that can't be removed, and you're worried about damaging the corals. But... I figure a lot of this is going to be happening on new tanks and a lot of people actually will have the option to manually remove the rock as you can see I'm doing here and then spray it with hydrogen peroxide. As you can see I put the hydrogen peroxide straight into the spray bottle. I don't dilute it with water at all and I also don't completely submerge the rock. You can see I just put it in a five gallon bucket here and I'm going to thoroughly spray it and make sure the rock is fully coated with the hydrogen peroxide at least where the algae is. I'm trying to make sure all the algae gets exposed to hydrogen peroxide. Now, you maybe could submerge the rock in hydrogen peroxide, but there's critters on there, and it, the peroxide might creep into the rock and take a while to 
get off and out of the rock and I want to make sure that I'm not exposing my tank to too much hydrogen peroxide. This method does work really well though for killing the algae and as you can see though first manually remove it because you don't want the algae to just be dying in your tank and releasing all those nutrients. Only the stuff you can't get off is what you want to treat with hydrogen peroxide. Now let's say that you actually can't remove the rock from your tank. Depending on your tank's situation, you might be able to do a water change and get the water level of your tank down significantly, exposing some rock as you can see here. Once that rock is exposed, you can do the same thing and spray it with hydrogen peroxide. I don't want to just dump hydrogen peroxide into my tank, but if you can expose it to air and then spray it with hydrogen peroxide, I have found that this is the best way, for me at least, and it definitely does the trick killing the algae. It won't always completely kill the algae, but it's definitely going to put a large dent into it and help you win that battle of bringing your tank back into equilibrium where algae isn't taking things over. All right, now that we've manually removed and exterminated as much algae as possible, you need to test, watch your tank, and adjust your import or export or preferably both. Now, this is where it's gonna take some time and you really gotta watch, test, and see what's going on with your tank to find that equilibrium. After you manually removed all of that algae and everything else stays the same, you would almost expect to see now, instead of testing zero, I'm gonna test a little bit above zero for nitrates and phosphates. And whatever you were doing in the past, there was an abundant amount of food for your tank which caused algae to take off and grow out of control. So you need to decrease the amount of food, which is nitrate and phosphate. I highly recommend export. If you're maxed out on export and you don't have the means to get something else, I understand that. But if you were running your refugium for six hours a day, pump that up to 12 hours a day. You should be able to reduce the amount of food. And that is actually really common when people are overfeeding. But I can tell you from my personal experience, as well as a lot of research that it's good to have high input, high output, but in equilibrium. I would argue it's better to have those two things high than those two things low. But what's important is just the right amount of equilibrium to where you've got just enough food in there to support the life that's in there, that you're not running at zero and having negative consequences from that, but not too much to where you have that algae outbreak. And this is actually really common for newer tanks or tanks that have been neglected. You know, older tanks that don't get neglected, you'll find they really don't have as much of algae issues. It's just getting to that point. That's what's the hard part. So hang in there, you'll eventually get there. And once you're there, it gets a little bit easier. Okay, and I hope you're enjoying it. Reef ain't easy. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Like, subscribe, comment, all that good stuff.